Today, we'll learn as much as we can about evolution and answer questions like, how does an organism or species adapt to its environment so that it has a better chance of survival to produce more offspring? We'll study the early ideas on evolution and explore more modern topics like natural selection and variation. Later on, we'll touch up on Darwin's observations that he made on the Galapagos Islands, and this will help answer questions like, how did descendants differ from their ancestors biologically over several generations? And most importantly, after watching this video, it'll clear up some misconceptions that you might share with the general public on evolution. One of the first segments in this video is about the early ideas on evolution. So we'll look at a few scientists and the ideas that they had and how they influenced our understanding of evolution. So one of the first guys was Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s, and he developed this classification system to name living things, and they're all grouped by similarities. So on the picture that's above my head, you can see how animals are classified and you have these different levels. So the broadest level would be domain, followed by kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So there's a mnemonic device that can help you memorize that. So kings play chess on fat green stools. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So human beings, people, are classified as homo sapien according to the genus species naming system. So typically um, you want to look at the two uh, most specific levels the two smallest levels, which is genus and species. So Homo would be the genus, so that encompasses a lot of different primates, and then sapiens would be our species, so we're known as Homo sapiens. So Linnaeus clearly had an idea that maybe we're all linked by a common ancestor and that there was a need to classify all these different species. So here's the taxonomy of dogs, humans, and ostriches. And you can see how there's some similarities, right? So humans, ostriches, and dogs, we're all in the, the uh, animal kingdom. We're all in the chordata phylum, which means we all have a vertebrae. And humans and dogs are both mammals, but ostriches, this is where it kind of branches off. An ostrich belongs in a different class. They're in the avis, okay, which means bird. All right, so as you go down, you become more and more specific. So in the example that I mentioned in the previous clip, humans are Homo sapiens, that would be our genus species. Dogs would be Canis lupus, but there's also a subspecies. It goes beyond that, so it becomes even more specific. So the subspecies would then classify a dog as Canis lupus familiaris. And then you can look at the ostrich, right? So it has all these crazy like order, family, genus, and species. So this is known as taxonomy, and this is how we classify and organize all the different species that are out there in the world, okay? including plants and fungus and any living thing. So next up is Buffon in the 1700s who proposed that species have shared ancestors instead of arising separately. So the idea that the domesticated house cat comes from a wild cheetah where these two species might have some common ancestor seems to make sense because they look very similar again it's a whole idea on structure and function like cats kind of look like wild cats right they have a tail they have claws they look very slender and sleek so this not only applies to cats but pretty much every living thing that you can find on earth like for example like the dog right so a dog looks very similar to a wolf so it's speculated that a domesticated dog, your French bulldog or your corgi, they all come from a common ancestor shared with the wolf. Okay, It's not like they arise from a wolf separately. They have a shared common ancestor. And in the picture that's above me, you have a human being that has a common ancestor with chimpanzees and gorillas and it just depends how far you trace it back on that tree of life. Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather, piggybacked on this idea that Buffon had, and he proposed that all living things were descended from a common ancestor. So just like how I was discussing before, you have your gray wolf, which is the common ancestor for all the different dog species that you have in Europe, in North America, China, and India. 
and then you also have different subspecies and such. Now we have John Baptiste Lamarck, whose early ideas would later become known as adaptation and natural selection, although he wasn't completely correct because his ideas were more on the extreme side. So for example, he proposed that the environment would cause an organism to have to adapt by using or not using a certain structure or an organ, and this would allow the organism to survive and then pass those changes on to offspring. But again, it's a little bit more extreme because in that center, in that logic, that means if you start flapping your arms a lot, as a human being, you would then develop wings and then learn how to fly. I'm not here to challenge your beliefs on religion, but the Bible states the Earth is 6,000 years old. This would make fossil evidence unusable in the theory of evolution. So the age of the Earth is a key issue because if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, this is not enough time for evolution to occur. There's a lot of misconceptions that human beings arose directly from a chimpanzee or a monkey. The idea instead is that we arose from a common ancestor that you can trace back millions and millions of years. So if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, then you can't have a theory on evolution. And this would also discount fossils. You can carbon date fossils and fossils are millions of years old, so this would contradict what's stated in the Bible. Now you need some scientists to now come forth and say that the Earth is very old, right? Because if the Bible says the Earth is only 6,000 years old, again, that means you can discount fossil evidence. So James Hutton was one of the first guys to propose that the Earth is extremely old, and he said that geologic change can occur gradually. This is known as gradualism, and Charles Lyell, in 1830 published a book called Principles of Geology and he also said that the earth is extremely old and these changes in earth occur at a constant rate so things like sedimentation and these different layers that you find in the earth's crust this was what allowed the theory of evolution to finally develop and this affected Darwin's thinking and these changes can also be observed today. If there's a Mount Rushmore for science, you might have to put Charles Darwin on it because he's basically the father of evolution. In 1831, he set sail on a five-year voyage in the HMS Beagle all around the world, but he's best known for stopping on the Galapagos Islands and making these observations about the different species. He studied their variation, and he later released a book called On the Origin of Species, describing all of his journeys. Here's a trip that I took to the Galapagos Islands as well as Ecuador back in the summer of 2015. In the bottom right, I'm posing with an iguana. And in the top right, I'm at the Atavala Market in Ecuador. So Ecuador is in South America and the Galapagos Islands is actually a territory of Ecuador and it's a couple hundred miles west of it. And then in the top picture, I'm posing with a giant tortoise. Darwin also noticed there was variation between the different species of tortoises. So a tortoise that lives on Pinta Island has a different shell from ones that live on Hood Island where you have a saddleback shell. And you also have the Isabella Island tortoise and those guys have dome-shaped shells. So they have different features and adaptations. And not only did he study tortoises, he also looked at different types of birds mainly the finches, and he noticed how their beaks were adapted to eat different types of foods depending on what was available and what islands they came from. So if you have a broad beak that was designed for smashing seeds, and if you have more nimble beaks that was designed for eating insects. So these are the principles on evolution as described by Charles Darwin in his book On the Origin of Species After His Voyage. So he called it variation overproduction, adaptation, and descent with modification, which means over time you have something called natural selection, which means only the, the strong survive. So the species with the adaptations that are suited for survival end up reproducing and it allows the species to go on. So here's a really famous case study on the peppered moth, which is discussed in every biology class whenever evolution comes up because it touches upon topics like adaptation and natural selection. So I want you to look at the picture on the left and then compare it to the picture on the right. 
So before the Industrial Revolution, soot was rare in the English countryside. You didn't have much pollution, right? You didn't burn coal for electricity and heat and things like that. So um, the countryside was really clean. So that means white peppered moths blended in with their background because the bark was clean. But during and after the Industrial Revolution, you had this change occur. Okay, and so the bark was now getting covered in soot. So now the white moths were really easy to spot by predators. So they ended up getting eaten. So what happened was the population of black peppered moths actually increased during and after the Industrial Revolution because their color allowed them to blend in to the soot covered trees. I just want to clear up a misconception that students tend to have with this idea and that is the moths were able to suddenly just transform the colors of their wings like the white moths all of a sudden could take on black wings and they camouflage. That's not the case. Okay, because there was always variation to begin with. Before the Industrial Revolution, the black moths were always around. It's just their numbers weren't very high to begin with, but after the Industrial Revolution, now that the whole countryside is covered in soot, the black moths were able to have better fitness and they were able to survive and produce more offspring relative to other members of the population. So they had an advantage over the white moths. So again, this is known as natural selection. So you have this ability to survive a lot better and now you can proliferate and you can produce more offspring and they have a better chance of survival. So this takes place over many generations and the misconception is that the white moths just became black. That's not the case. Now we're gonna look at the evidence for evolution and there's four pieces, fossils, geography, embryology, and anatomy. But the first one we'll look at are the fossil records because this tends to support Darwin's idea on descent with modification. So um, what that means is there's change over time. So how fossils work is the bottom layer is the oldest and the top layers are the newest. So if you compare the descendants with the ancestors, you can find some similarities and differences, but it supports the idea that there's change over time. Number two is geography. So Darwin realized that the finches found on the Galapagos were very similar to the ones found on the mainland in South America. So here's a cartoon which describes this whole process. So the founders will arrive from the mainland to the Galapagos. So now they're here on the Galapagos Islands. They get separated and there might be changes in the gene pool. There's differences in their habits and their diets and it might change their beaks. So you have an A and a B species. But then what will happen is after many decades or generations of reproductive isolation, some of them actually might fly back and they might cross with each other. So species A and B will cross with each other. They'll mate and re reproduce with each other. And they'll form a species C, which you see as the purple one. So then they will then fly off to different parts of the islands. And there's like different niches, right? And you have different uh, nooks and crannies on the islands and it forms variability. So over time, these traits become well established in the different islands and um, the different environments on each island okay, might lead to specific adaptations like things like diets, uh, their beak shapes, and their habits. So that's why when you look on uh, the Galapagos Islands, there's a lot of different species of finches. It's known as adaptive radiation okay, and this is all because of geography and the changes in the environment. Now we have something called embryology. So when you look at um, the embryos from different species or animals, you can see there's a lot of similarities between them. And this might suggest that we share a common ancestor with things like pigs and tortoises and lizards. So let's just look at all of them frame by frame. Here's a human embryo in the early stages of development. And right next to it is a pig. Then you have a tortoise and a lizard. 
And then as the embryos develop, um, you can see that they stay very similar, right? It's only when you see the adult form that you can see we're in a lot different from these animals, but early on in the stages of development, you can see that we're very similar in um, how the embryos uh, start to grow. Homologous structures, which are things that are similar in structure, but they have different functions. So you can look at a penguin, an alligator, a bat, and a human limb. You can see how the bones are all very similar, but they all have different functions. So like a penguin has a little flipper, alligator has like short stubby little arms, and a bat wing is designed to fly. But when you look at the bones, they're all very similar. Same with like a leaf, right? So you can look at a pitcher plant or like a Venus flytrap. Okay, the Venus flytrap has the leaves modified to catch insects. And then you have a poinsettia and a cactus. And look at the pictures, they're all slightly different. Okay, so again, this is evidence for a common ancestor. Here are analogous structures, which are structures that perform similar functions, but it's not similar in origin. So for example, if you look at a, a moth wing versus a bat wing or a bird wing, you could see that those guys here, okay, the ones that are highlighted in purple, it's designed to fly. Those are known as analogous structures. But look at the, the actual makeup of it. Um, you can see that they're all uh, slightly different. Okay, and so the structure here, the bone structure might be slightly different. And of course, uh, the last piece here is it's called vestigial structures. So these are structures or organs that don't have any modern day function. So for a human being, that would be the appendix. And it's thought that the human appendix was used to digest vegetables back then, or diets that were high in cellulose. And a whale has this little piece here that no longer has a function. It's a little bone that really doesn't do anything. So um, this might suggest that we have some sort of early ancestor, and it's all supported by fossil evidence as well. There are many conclusions that you can draw on evolution but most importantly is that it unites all different fields of biology. There's so much new technology out there that we could use that to study and support evolution. So for example, DNA technology, you can look at DNA sequences between different primates and compare that to human beings and then trace that back to a common ancestor. And best of all, the principles of evolution can be used to study medicine, disease, and ecology which we'll discuss in the next couple videos. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time on Wind Biology.